I want to share with you a story. On a dangerous sea coast where shipwrecks often occur, there was a once a crude little life-saving station. The building was just a hut, and there was only one boat, but a few devoted members kept a constant watch over the sea with no thought for themselves. They went out day or night, tirelessly searching for the lost. Many lives were saved by this wonderful little station so that it became famous. Some of those who were saved and various others in the surrounding areas wanted to become associated with the station and give their time and money and effort to the support of its work. New boats were bought and new crews were trained, and the little life-saving station grew. Some of the new members of the life-saving station were unhappy that the building was so crude and so poorly equipped. So they felt that a more comfortable place should be provided as a first refuge for those who were saved from the sea. So they replaced the emergency cots with beds and put better furniture in an enlarged building. So now the life-saving station became a popular gathering place for its members. And they redecorated it beautifully and furnished it as sort of a club. Less of the members were now interested in going to sea on life-saving missions, so they hired uh, lifeboat crews to do this work for them. The mission of the life-saving station was still given lip service, but most were too busy or lacked the necessary commitment to take part in the life-saving activities personally. Now, about this time, a large ship was wrecked off the coast, and the hired crews brought in boatloads of cold, wet, and half-drowned people. They were dirty and sick. Some of them had different skin colors. And some spoke a strange language, but the, and the beautiful new club was considerably messed up when they arrived. So the property committee immediately had a shower house built outside the club where victims of shipwreck could be cleaned up before coming inside. At the next meeting, uh, there was a split in the club membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities as being unpleasant and a hindrance to the normal pattern of life for the club. But some members insisted that life-saving was still their primary purpose and pointed out that they were still called a life-saving station. But they were finally voted down and told that if they wanted to save the the life of all the various kinds of people who were shipwrecked in those those waters, they could begin their own life-saving station down the coast. So that's what they did. They started a new one. As the years went by, the new station experienced the same changes that had occurred in the old one. They evolved into a club, and yet another life-saving station was founded. And if you visit that seacoast today, you'll find a number of exclusive clubs along that shore. Shipwrecks are still frequent in those waters, only now most of the people drown. A parable of what the church can become if we are not careful. God has called us to a specific mission of saving lives. That's why we are here. If God just was about saving those of us who were already saved. He could just take us right home to heaven. But he has left us here because we still have a mission. And even though we may make our building comfortable and our meetings pleasant and, you know, have electronic amplification of our instruments and, you know, microphones for us and all these kind of things that, to make it nice and pleasant for us to come together to learn God's word, we have never been, the church was never designed as a place to come and stay. It was a place to come and be trained and sent out on the same life-saving mission that rescued us. And so that's what we're going to be looking at this morning is the fact that we are, as a church, are called forth. Now, last week, we talked about the fact that we're called together, okay? And that's the first of the points in our, in our message this morning. You've got uh, notes in your outline that you can follow, is that we have been called together. And we've been called together to encourage one another and to love one another, to support and help each other, and to spur each other on in God's mission. But that's not something that we accomplish here. We gather for the purpose of going. And that's really what we're going to talk about this morning is the go. The go that's a part of what God's uh, plan is for us. Now, the most common going passage that most of us are going to think of, it comes in Matthew chapter 28. This is what we call the Great Commission. And I'm going to read that to you, those three verses there. Matthew 28, and we're going to start in verse 18. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, when we look at this command here, we see that there's four imperatives for us, okay? Four things that we're supposed to do. You see, go, make disciples, baptize, and teach. But there's one of those commands that is the primary, and the other three are supporting, 
okay? The primary command is to make disciples. That's our task, is to, go, is to make disciples. But how do we do that? Well, in part by baptizing, okay? People make the commitment. They make the change from being a part of the world to being a part of God's kingdom. That's what baptism represents. It's your initiation into the kingdom of God and into his family. And then what you do ongoingly, you teach them, okay? A person gets baptized once, but teaching happens ongoingly and teaching them all that God has commanded. Those are the things that we're supposed to do. So those two things are I-N-G words, okay? Because they are, they're, they're a process. This is something we continue to do. So as you make disciples, you're baptizing and you're teaching, but that first command is one of them that we don't often think of in the same way because it just says go in our English translation. But in the Greek, it is actually the same. It is a participle, an I-N-G word, just like the others. Going. Going make disciples. As you are going or having gone. Those are other ways that you could translate that. So as you are going, make disciples. There's this sort of like assumption you are going to be a going people. Okay, so as we are called forth, God has called us forth to go with his message and to go forward into the world. But this is very interesting that this is not the first time this go is given to the disciples. Okay, Matthew 28, that's the end of the gospel. Jesus has risen from the dead. He's getting ready to ascend up into heaven. And he says to his people, go. But this was not the first time they were sent out. What was the process that Jesus used in part for making his own disciples, he gave them field assignments. Not like homework that you take home and you sit and do, but let's get out in the field and do this. He would send out the 12. He sent out the 70 later on, two by two, to go with his message of the kingdom. And that's what I want to look at is this on-the-job training. Now, this, we see this in Luke chapter 9. Uh, Luke chapter 9, and we're going to start by reading to you verse 2. Okay? He sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to perform healing. He sent them out with a message to declare. He sent them out to de declare the kingdom message, the kingdom of God. And he was doing this in a place that was under the control of a different king or a different ruler. Okay, because Satan is called the ruler of this world. The disciples go out and say, the kingdom of God has come. The kingdom of God is here. That's the message that they are supposed to declare. But God didn't just give them the go, he gave them the gear that they needed in order to do this. Go with this message, but I am equipping you, I am gearing you up with what you need. And that's what we see in verse 1. Okay, I just read you verse 2, now let's look at verse 1. It says, he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all the demons and to heal diseases. He gave them two things. He gave them power, and he gave them authority. Authority is the right to represent someone else. I'm, giving, I'm commissioning you with the right to represent my Father in heaven, to represent his kingdom here on earth as you go forth. But I'm also giving you the power to demonstrate that kingdom. Okay, do you understand the difference? Okay, if I have, a, a police officer has authority, okay, that's what his badge represents. He's authorized by the government to, to enforce laws and stuff, but then he's also given weapons to give him power to enforce that authority. Jesus said, you are my authorized representatives, and I am giving you my power, my Father's power, to be able to do this, to demonstrate this kingdom, okay? And over specifically what? Demons and disease, I've given you authority over, um, over the demons and over diseases. Because the demons are the presence of that other kingdom. The diseases are the evidence of that kingdom. Okay, because Satan works those sicknesses in, in people. And he said, I have given you the authority over both of those. Satan's presence and his power are both confronted. And their calling is still our calling to be ones who go out as kingdom representatives to declare God's message and to demonstrate the power of that message, okay? And to demonstrate it really in the same way. The, Satan, you know, the power over um, the enemy and power over diseases. Now, the problem is, is that sometimes we fall short in either one or both of these areas. And the fact that we don't declare as we should or we don't demonstrate as we should. So I'm going to look at both of those real briefly here. 
One is that sometimes we have a whispered declaration. You know what? God sent you out to declare a message. I'm going to declare the message. I'm going to declare, but I declare it really weakly. I don't speak it forth commensurate with the authority that I have been given. We just whisper the message about God. Oh, yeah, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. Or This is what God said, but we say it quietly. We don't proclaim it with, with confidence. We live it out, but we don't speak it out. Okay, it might, I might be trying obeying God's commands and trying to keep my life in order, in obedience to the Lord. That's great. That's a good starting point. But sometimes n- people are not always going to ask. Sometimes people will say, why are you different? I, I, see what, I see you're different. Can you tell me about it? But not everybody's going to ask, but everybody needs to know. Sometimes we have to choose to take some initiative that I am going to share this. But also we can be guilty sometimes of a weak demonstration of that power. Now, there's a few, a few ways that we could do this. One is that we don't live a transformed life. If I don't see God's power at work in me, the fact that I am overcoming you know, the, the, the sinful tendencies and, and the, the work of the enemy in my own life, okay? But also is that we don't fail, or sometimes we fail to cast out the enemy, to take authority over Satan and his, his work in the world around us, okay? In um, Matthew 12, verse uh, 28, Jesus is being um, confronted by some of the religious leaders because he cast out a demon. And they, they thought that, oh, you're just doing that by Satan's power. And part of this dialogue Jesus has with them, he says, but if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When the demons have to go, that's a demonstration of the fact that the new king is there, and he's saying to all the, the, the cronies of his, that previous king, you've got no right to be here. You have to go. We are ridding this land of this. So, so like when um, World War II, okay, D-Day, the invasion happened, you know, the, the allies are coming from two sides, Russia's from one side, most of the rest from another side. They're converging on Europe, and they're cleaning out the Nazis. You guys got no right to be here. We're taking territory after territory after territory, and the enemy has to go. God has given us the same right and authority and power to say to the demons, you've got no right to be here. In Jesus' name, get out. Get out of my life. Get out of my home. Get out of my family. Get out of my school. Get out of my friend. You've got no right to be here. And he has given us that authority. And we need to use that authority. We need to recognize the enemy's presence, recognize the authority we've been given, and say, take a hike. Go. Now, also, beyond just living a transformed life and removing the enemy, it's restoring the damage that Satan has done. We know that not every disease and sickness is a result of sin. And not every disease and sickness is necessarily going to be uh, the result of, of the enemy's work, but a lot of it is. And so we need to recognize that when we see Satan's hand in something, we not only say, Satan, go, but in Jesus' name, be healed. That's what you see happening in the New Testament. How often do we do that now? Then in Jesus' name, I pronounce God's healing over you. You are restored in Jesus' name. That's what we need to do. Not only to have the declaration, but to have the demonstration. Both of those, you see them together in the New Testament. And we need to become those kind of people who are declaring and demonstrating um, the power of God. Now, when two kings lay claim to the same territory, there is going to be conflict. Now, we've seen this very vividly this year over in Ukraine, right? We've got one land with one rulership, and another one comes in and says, I want that territory. There is going to be conflict. And it's the same thing in the spiritual realm. When Satan has a hold on something and God's kingdom comes in, Satan is not going to like it, and he is going to fight back. Now, we know he's not more powerful than God, but he wants to do as much damage as he can and hold on to as much territory as he can. And being a representative of God's kingdom means that you're going to be in the crossfire. You are going to be one that Satan is going to go after if you are coming in to take back his territory. Okay? So, we're going to look a little bit at three ways that this kingdom representative calling 
on each of us is difficult, okay? One is because of where you're going, where you're going. I want to read to you Matthew chapter 16, um, and excuse me, Matthew 16, verses 17 and 18. Jesus said to Peter, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, or bar Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Gates of Hades, some of your translations will say gates of hell, okay? The gates of Hades are not going to overpower it. So we are ones, and we've talked about gathering as a church, the go, the gearing up that we've been given, and now it's the gates. This is where we are being sent. Jesus is sending us out with a message, but he is sending us to the gates of hell. Now, when Jesus was speaking with these um, disciples here, okay, they were actually in a place or near a place called the gates of hell. It actually had that term, the gates of hell or gates of Hades. It was a place of idol worship. And so all the stuff that goes along with idol worship and the debauchery associated with that was going on in this place. And so when you hear the gates of hell, think of a place where Satan reigns. But we need to consider what exactly is the nature of a gate. Okay, how many of you have been injured by a gate before? Okay, not very many of us. Maybe a few of us are clumsy. You know, we've gotten our fingers pinched in it and gates swung back and hit us. Gates are not something that you take with you as an offensive weapon. Okay, when you're going into war, you don't take a gate and whack somebody with it right? A gate is a defensive structure. It is meant to protect something and to keep out the opposition. Satan has built his strongholds. He's put up the walls around it, but what's the weakest point in a wall? It's where the gate is. The wall is made of steel, the wall is made of stone, but a gate is made to open. It has a natural weakness to it in order to let things through. And God has said, I am giving the church authority over the gates of hell. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. What does that mean? Is the gate coming and battering against the church? No. We are the ones who are coming and storming against the gates of hell and saying, open up in the name of Jesus and you go on through. You take the battering ram, you burn those gates, you just bust through them and knock open the doors. Um, I love watching military stuff, military history and learning about that. And I learned uh, about a job that people have in special forces. I I think probably in other branches, but I know in the special forces they do. So um, you know at Atterbury, they train for urban combat, right? Okay, Camp Atterbury. Well, one of the things that they do when you're going into these urban settings and you're going to have to go into a building in order to extract someone or in order to to find the enemy, you've got to go through and break down a door. And there is one job in that squad of people that's called the breacher, okay? And a breacher is one whose job it is to knock down that door. You got to get that door open. And so I watched some videos and I was assuming, okay, that, you know, they might come with a battering ram or they might take like some sort of like packet of explosives and stick it like on the lock or something of the door. The ones I saw, they had a different method. If you can imagine like a long piece of duct tape, okay, it's probably six feet long, they would go up and they would stick this thing, okay, it's like duct tape, or maybe it is even duct tape with something else in it, along that door, and then they've got a cord, and they run off to the side, they hide up against the wall, and they hit that switch, and it blows that door off. Whatever's in that tape is explosive. And they breach the door, and then they charge in. God is calling for us to be breachers. We need to be ones who see a door And we know on the other side of that, there's people that God loves that are prisoners, and we've got to go in and get them. We are taking out that door. We are storming the gates of hell. As a church, we've got to stop being just defensive or like a rescue station there where it's like, okay, we're going to enjoy each other and realize we have been gathered for the purpose of gearing up and going out and taking back territory from the enemy. God is looking for people who are going to breach that wall. Now, what do we do once it is breached, though? We are going in on a rescue mission. We are going in to save those that God loves. I was uh, watching a video about a um, prisoner of war during the Iraq war. 
and how she was uh, kept at a hospital, and the special forces got together and had this mission, and they went in, and they extracted her from that hospital. There was somebody of value in there, a U.S. service member that was kept as a prisoner of war. They went in, and they got her out and got her out safely. God knows who's on the other side of that gate. Satan doesn't have to protect, doesn't have to have a gate up if there's not something valuable on the other side. Every person that's on the other side of that is a potential disciple. Every person on the other side of Satan's stronghold is a prisoner that God wants to set free. Now, I want to give you two um, brief examples, just going to reference them, and I think some verses might be up on the screens about it, but I'm just going to kind of reference them real quick, and then we're going to move on to a third uh, passage that I want to look at uh, a little more closely, okay? Do you remember in uh, Mark chapter 5, there was a guy that uh, had a legion of demons, or a whole bunch of demons inside of him. Jesus crossed over the lake, set this man free, and then when people saw the change in him after those demons were gone, I mean, he, he was clothed, he was in his right mind, and the people were freaked out. They actually told Jesus, get out of here, leave our region, because they saw the power of God demonstrated when this guy had been set free. The casting out of demons is a demonstration of the kingdom of God, and it shows people God's power, okay? And then in Luke chapter 13, there's a woman who is bent over double, and, God, and Jesus says, this woman has been in Satan's grasp for 18 years. Shouldn't she be set free? And he heals her. And she's able to straighten up immediately. A demonstration through healing that the kingdom of God has come. Now, I want you to look at the second to last book in the Bible. Okay, Jude. Now, you're going to see on the screens it says Jude 22 and 23. That's because Jude's only one chapter. So you don't even put up the chapter numbers. Just Jude, verses 22 and 23. And it says this. Have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire, and on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. Different people in different conditions of lostness, different degrees of bondage to the enemy. You know, there's some people who are doubting. We can exercise patience with them, help them understand God's truth. Okay, we we do this in a merciful and gentle way. But there's others They're in the burning car. They're in the burning building. You rush in and you snatch them out. You go in because their life is on the line and they are about to be taken out by the enemy. But then there's this third group that's kind of nuanced and it says have mercy on some, uh, mercy mixed with fear, okay? These people, I think of these as more like the, the people who are dabbling, okay? The first group, the doubting, the second are the dying, and the third is the dabbling. These are the people that they're involved in sin, and you want to go and get them, but it says, have some fear. Understand there's some danger to you. As you go, you could also be tempted. You could be exposing yourself to some stuff. You've you got to be careful about this to make sure you don't become a casualty in the process of trying to rescue someone else. So we have to understand there is a danger in what we are doing, and that's we go with a warning. Now, this warning is because there are both physical dangers and there are spiritual dangers to us when we are sent out, called forth as God's kingdom representatives, okay? And so as I'm going to read you a few passages here and just look and see how this is that we have both a physical and a spiritual danger, okay? I'm going to start with Matthew chapter 10, verses 16 to 18. Behold, I send you out as sheep among wolves. So be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. But beware of men, for they will hand you over to courts and scourge you in their synagogues. And you will be even brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. Sheep among wolves. That's not a very safe place to be. God has not called us to be safe. God has called us to a rescue mission. That means you're going into live fire. You're going into dangerous situations. Sheep among wolves, not a wolf among the sheep, okay? We're going to be in the minority. Sheep among the many wolves. It is a dangerous situation, okay? In 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter tells us, be of sober spirit, 
Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Okay? Satan, like a lion, and you're on the lunch menu. He's looking for someone to devour. But he says, there are other people who are suffering. Satan can bring not only spiritual danger, he can bring physical suffering to you. But you know what? That's okay. We're not called to be safe. We're called to go. And we're called to rescue. And he tells us, uh, James tells us, how it is that we can stand against the enemy here. Uh, this is James 4, 7. Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Repent from sin, draw near to God, and when you get close to him, Satan's going to be scared. If you are getting close to God, Satan is going to flee, not because of you, but because of your father. He is scared of him. He might not be scared of you, but he knows who God is. In the Great Commission, it says um, that we are to go, we're to make disciples of all nations, okay? Sometimes God brings the nations to us, the, other, the people from other ethnic groups and stuff, but God has called us to also be a going people. I remember when I was uh, interested in being a missionary, I talked to somebody from my uh, home denomination, and he gave me a book to read about making disciples. Uh, it was something that just encouraged you to kind of work with small groups of people uh, right where you are. And he gave me a really good word of wisdom, I guess you'd call it, or a word of um, caution. And because I'm wanting to go, you know, be a missionary off in the far flung reaches of the world. And he said, you know what, if you're not doing it here, you're not going to do it there. When it comes to making disciples, I could think it's like, I'm going to go off to the exotic locations and nobody else is going to do it. You know, nobody else is going to want to go to these places of hardship and difficulty and different languages and heat and bugs and all this kind of stuff. I'm going to, I'll go. But the thing was, this guy wisely looked, it's like, okay, what does your life look like now? Are you a person who is making disciples right where you are? Are you winning souls right where you are? Are you planting churches right where you are? Are you starting gatherings of believers right now? Look for the activity, and then it doesn't matter where you put that person, they're going to go forward. I think of it like a, uh, <clears throat> if, you, if you've been in uh, toy stores and you've seen those displays, okay, and they have a, some sort of like a little wind-up toy or whatever, and it goes forward, um, it's always going forward, but if it hits a wall, it backs up and it turns and goes a different direction until it hits a wall, okay, they put them in these the, like, little enclosed display cases, okay? The thing is with that toy, it is always going forward. If it hits a wall, it just changes direction. It's got its activity. As a believer in Jesus Christ, as one of his sent kingdom representatives, are you a person whose default activity is to be a goer and a teller? You know what? If you run into a roadblock with this person, okay, well, I'm going to go tell somebody else. I'm going to be doing that activity no matter where you put me. That's what God has called us to, to be ones who are constantly going forward, even if it is just across the street, or it could be across the country or across the world. Are you a goer? God has called us to be ones who are breachers, who are goers. Um, before we, there's a, just a little bit more I want to share with you in closing, but before we do that, I want to uh, I encourage you to think of the world that you live in, your, your sphere, okay? Not necessarily the whole world, but I'm talking like the sphere of the people around you. As you glance around, are you seeing gates of hell? Are you seeing places that are strongly defended by the enemy? I got to tell you, uh, I have been introduced to one in, in uh, multiple ways this year that uh, I did not necessarily expect. Okay, I've got um, two kids in private school. I've got one in public school, public high school. And we're getting um, notifications of curriculum <laughs> and things that are being taught in the schools, books that are being read, movies that are being viewed. And we're realizing, um, you know, my um, people are introducing themselves and saying, okay, here, here's my name and here's my preferred pronouns. 
you know, and this, I've got, you know, my kids asking, okay, well, how do I deal with a person in my class who is trans? You know, and they want, they want to go by this name. It's like, how do you be respectful and loving, but not necessarily endorsing of that behavior? You know, it, it's a difficult way, way to walk. The schools are a place that the gates of hell are shut really tight. But God has sent his people in there as agents of light, as representatives of his kingdom. He sent some adults in there, but he's also sending the kids in there. Our young people need to be geared up and need to be equipped and understand that they have all the same authority as any adult when it comes to be, oh, as a believer in Jesus Christ. He has given them the same commission that he has given us to go in as agents of light and to be ones who are going to be breaching the doors and going in to rescue souls. I mean, I don't fault people at all for saying, I want my kids in a Christian school. I've got two kids in Christian school or people who do homeschool. But you know what? It is a calling to be in the public school as well as an agent of light in a very, very dark place. If I go into um, our, our library downtown, okay, on the architectural tour and all that kind of stuff, you walk down into the basement. What's in the basement? The kids section, right? And you walk in there and they've got that display table of here's the books of the month, you know, whatever the, the particular thing is. You have Black History Month or it, it could be something that's, you know, emphasizing a particular area, science or whatever. And you go down there, I think it's in June, and it's like, what is it? It's Gay Pride Month. And so you've got all these kids' books down there about all this LGBT stuff, okay, trying to indoctrinate the kids. The library, it's got the, it's the gates of hell right there. But what do we as people need to do? We need to be as the people of God going in and storming the gates of hell. Now, what does that look like? Okay, that's not that we're actually going in and banging on doors and yelling and stuff like that. We're going in prayerfully. We are going in with God's love, but we're also going in with God's truth. Okay, you see people who are addicted. It could be to, you know, drugs, alcohol, smoking. It could be to gambling or pornography. It could be even addicted to, um, you know, like uh, workaholism and, and success or whatever. G Satan's got all kinds of ways of getting at us to keep us all wadded up and chained up so that we can't go and do what God has called us to do. If you see a person that's in bondage, they're behind the gates of hell. We pray, we pray, we pray. We love that person we speak God's truth to them. We come alongside with practical help. If you identify the gates of hell, those are gates that should not remain closed and they should not remain standing. God has called his church to go against them. But understand, it's going to be hard. It will be costly and it can be painful because Satan wants to take you out. It is a dangerous calling. I want to close with... Uh, this is a true story. The thing I read to you earlier about the life-saving station, that was a parable, all right? This one, though, is true. The official Coast Guard motto, Semper Paratus, means always ready. It's been a guiding light for those worthy members of this service whose duties have been expanded and added to many times over. And the greatest of these duties has been to preserve the lives of those who go down to the sea in ships. Well, more than half a century ago, I think this was in the 40s, when the words were spoken by a Coast Guard surfman at the scene of a surf boat launching, okay, where they, they're going out into the surf to go out and rescue. Okay? And these have become the unofficial battle cry of Coast Guardsmen to this day. It was in the teeth of an Atlantic storm. A large merchant vessel had founded, uh, foundered. The Coast Guard surf boat was being launched into the surf in an effort to reach the ship and rescue the crew. And a reporter at the scene asked the surfman in charge why they were attempting this seemingly impossible task. And this surfman, the Coast Guard rescueman, replied, they say we must go out and try. They don't say anything about coming back. As Christians, we are called to rescue those who are perishing. And we are told, go out. We're not told we have to come back safely. We are called to go. Mark Dever, he's a pastor, I think, out in Washington, D.C. He was talking about closed countries, places like North Korea, you know, where it's like you can be killed for even possessing a Bible, okay? It, it's a hard place to go. And he, we often refer to them as closed countries. And Mark said, 
You know what? There's no such thing as a closed country. Only places where it's harder to preach your second sermon. He's called us to go out with a message. He's called us to go to the gates of hell. He's called us to go out to rescue. The thing is, we're not guaranteed that in this life, we're going to make it back safely. But he does have a guarantee for us. And I want to close with this passage. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Paul, in prison, says this, I fought the good fight, I finished the course, I've kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all those who have loved his appearing. I'm at the end of my life. I'm not going to make it back home here safely, but he's guaranteed me safe passage on to my heavenly home. Are we going to spend our lives enjoying the rescue station? Or are we going to expend our lives going out in the rescue attempt, knowing that hopefully we'll rescue a lot along the way, and when there comes a time that we don't come back, we're going safely home. So our final destination is certain. What remains to be seen is whether we'll go out. So as we have our closing song this morning, I want to encourage you, think through and ask the Lord, God, what gates of hell are there here that I need to go and storm? Where is there a wreck where I need to go and to rescue people? And I would encourage us, make the commitment this morning, God, I don't know if I'm going to make it back, but I am going to go out. I'm going to go with the declaration of your message, but I'm also going to go and trust that you are going to show your power as well. And if you do that, and you are dedicated to going out with that message, trust God is going to show up with that power. You will make it safely home, and hopefully you'll bring others with you as well.